Some say talk is cheap. Others say sticks and stones break bones, but words can never hurt. But not so in my case. By the end of my story, you'll see why I say not so. Can you imagine me, a man from a tiny 166 square mile island nation, just granted independence from the imperialist Great Britain, at the General Assembly of the United Nations, tell the superpowers, we will be friends of all but satellites of none? Some hail me as the father of independence, others Dipper, but I am Errol Walton Barrow. Remember we are talking about words. My father, Reverend Reginald Grant Barrow, had studied the Holy Ministry at Codrington College from 1909. This was a rare achievement since men of African descent in that profession were very uncommon. After completing study, he became curator at the St. Lucy's Parish Church. Early in 1920, the year I was born, he was relocated to St. Croix, where he continued to use the pulpit to challenge the scourge of racism. His refusal to be intimidated got him fired as priest, and he became a member of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the AME. Founding a branch in St. Croix through which he continued to attack the overwhelming social injustice of that day. He also became editor of the Herald there, which like the Barbados Herald was radical in representing the working class. His words caught the attention of the local authorities and he was deported when I was merely two years old. He later became principal of the Aline School. My mother, the former Ruth Alberta O'Neill, was sister of Dr. Charles Duncan O'Neill, who influenced me greatly. According to my brother, Reginald Graham Barrow, I got many ideas from O'Neill. This was a time when many Barbadians lived in political and economic misery. The only outlet was to migrate to Panama, Cuba, or America. Being part of the fortunate blacks of that day, if my uncle a doctor and father with status was an asset. This afforded me a good primary and secondary education at Wesley Hall and Harrison College, which was really for children of the elite and the fortunate black working and middle class who won a scholarship. Winning an island scholarship in 1939 instead of going on to Codrington College, I opted to join the British Armed Forces. This experience would indeed help in preparing me for the leadership roles that would be thrust upon me later. The world was then in its second war. I joined the Royal Air Force and was appointed observer, navigator, leading air craftsman, sergeant, pilot officer and flying officer. My service was and led to an appointment as personal navigator to the Air Chief Marshal. Sir Sholto Douglas during the Allied occupation of Germany. Let me say here, this achievement of such high office and responsibility was rare for any person of African descent in any of the Allied nations armed forces. This experience could have helped to make my mixing with people of different racial backgrounds easy. After the war, I was placed in a supervisory position in a colonial office. I finally graduated with a bachelor's degree in economics and industrial law from the University of London and was called to the English Bar. In the Caribbean, a degree in law or medicine was considered the prerequisite for entry into political life, since these professions offered financial independence. My wife Carolyn and daughter Leslie returned to Barbados with me in 1950 and I started my practice as a barrister at law. It was then that Grant Lee Adams noticed that my leadership skills would greatly enhance his cause and political reform. After joining the Barbados Labour Party, the BLP, I contested a seat in the general elections of 1951 and became the senior member representing St. George. 
At that time, there was a double member constituency system in which the person gaining the highest votes was senior and the runner-up was designated the junior member. There were three political parties, the Electors Association, the BLP and the Congress Party. I still remember my first speech in the House of Assembly. We were debating a bill to establish third party insurance. However, I would not be confined to that single matter under discussion and I said, There is another point which is not germane to the present issue, but at some very early date, we shall have definitely to revise and amend the Separation and Maintenance Act 1950 and make its provisions more widely known to the community. However, I do not intend to dwell on that issue, but having a cursory glance at the present act, I say that there are certain things which need to be amended. Being trained under Professor Harold Lasky, it was rather difficult for the leadership of the BLP to keep me in check, and within a few years a rift developed. Myself and a few others, including Frank Walcott, were at loggerheads with Grant Lee Adams, the leader over the pace of reform and direction of policy. In 1955, I told the House of Assembly, I am going to make a very serious decision now and because I regard this unemployment as the most pressing problem facing this island at the present, and in view of the fact that I am completely dissatisfied not only with the Honourable Minister of Labour, but with the whole attitude of ministers in this government, and their complete disregard of the suffering of the people and of the party. Because of that, I no longer want to be associated with them politically or otherwise. With this, I resigned from the BLP, and along with J. Cameron Tudor and others formed the Democratic Labour Party. That move would cost me my seat the following year, but I re-entered Parliament winning a by-election in St. John in 1958 where I successfully and continually served until my death on June 1, 1987. 1961 proved to be a success for my Democratic Labour Party, as it won the general election and I became Premier. It was during this term that I fought for the country's independence. I remember telling them it was best that Barbados be not found loitering on colonial premises after closing time. Independence was finally granted to us on November 30th, 1966, and I became the first Prime Minister. Under my leadership, Barbados would play a major role in Caribbean integration. One achievement was the formation of the Caribbean Free Trade Area, CARIFTA, in 1965, with Barbados, Antigua, and Guyana being the first to sign. The others joined in 1968. CARIFTA was later expanded and reorganized as Caribbean Community and Common Market, CARICOM. Michael Manley, then Prime Minister, had this to say about me. But this claim upon history will extend far beyond the boundaries of Barbados. He will take his place amongst the significant heroes of Caribbean history. When we are brought finally by circumstance to the point where the region which was foreseen by the deeper thinkers of the 30s and 40s he will take his place as a major architect of the process. In the 10 years from 1966 to 1976, my efforts saw the introduction of a national insurance and social security scheme and school meals on an improved nutritional basis, improved health services and the opening of the QEH hospital, accelerated industrial development and considerable expansion of the tourist industry. That decade had seen the increase from a single to a multi-sector economy, agriculture, tourism and manufacturing. In tribute, a senator who later rose to Deputy Prime Minister said of me, He has now joined the ranks of those heroes fallen on the battlefield. He died not in retirement, but at the helm of this country. I think that this should be the lesson and instruction that we learn from his life that we must press on toward that goal which we set ourselves. There are many landmarks that pay tribute to my memory. A memorial park in Wildey, the ABC Highway, 
which I share with JMGM Tom Adams and H. Gordon Cummings. On April 28th, 2007, a full-length statue of me was unveiled in Independence Square. My birthday, January 21st, is also celebrated as a public holiday.